All right, you're here. It's the Indie Drills Podcast. Chad Wilson here with you. I'm the owner of All Eyes DB Camp, if you didn't know that already. And it's another edition of the Indie Drills Podcast sponsored by 101 DB Tips. You all should have a copy of this. Nevertheless, what do we do on this show? We talk about defensive backs, defensive back plays, secondary. It's an all DB podcast. Very happy to be here with you guys. And thank you all for joining in. If you haven't had a chance yet, go ahead and subscribe to the show, whether you are watching me on YouTube or listening to me on some streaming device, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever the case may be. All right, let's just jump right into things. No big DB news out there for us to go over other than the fact that quarterbacks continue to break the bank, make tons of money in the NFL, and squeeze those cap numbers for each and every team. And I hope that doesn't lead to less money being spent on defense and defensive backs. Talked about it in earlier shows about Justin Simmons being released by Denver because they're in cap hell because of the quarterback situation. Uh, I just know this, and I spoke about it on the Two Chumps podcast with Amo Calaminos, that if you are spending money on a quarterback, that means you now need to have some insurance for that quarterback. What's the insurance? The insurance is making sure that the guys up front can block for them, in particular the left tackle. So you got to get the best left tackle possible. That means you got to spend money on the le- on the left tackle. And on top of having insurance, you got to have some performance for this high-priced item that you've got, which is the quarterback. And so what is Ensuring the performance, you've got to have weapons for him. So now you got to have the best wide receivers out there. And how do we get those? We've got to spend a bunch of money on wide receivers. So you're tying up money in the left tackle. You're tying up money in wide receivers. And you're tying up money in the quarterback. That's a whole lot of money being spent in just a few handful of those positions. And now other positions got to take a hit. Well, what do most teams think they need to do to win games? It's they've got to get the quarterback on the ground, right? So they go spend a bunch of money on a pass rusher. And now we're getting the the dollar amounts and are starting to really, really shrink. So that's just something for you guys to pay attention to. Owners now are grumbling about, you know, maybe they want to get a salary cap for quarterbacks or for positions or whatever the case may be. I'm all for it. I don't think one guy should be making over 20% of the salary cap. Frankly, I don't think they should make more than 15%. One guy on a team of 53 uh, when there is a hard salary cap in a sport, shouldn't be making more than 15%. But, yay, that's just me. And, again, that's probably the biggest threat right now to defensive backs, um, at least in the NFL. And we're going to have to see how that thing kind of shakes out. All right, I want to play this game uh, with you guys, and it's uh, it's coming up here on the show. I'm going to give away a digital copy. That means an ebook copy of 101 DB Tips. I'm going to tell you guys how you're going to do be able to do that coming up in the show. We're going to play a little game here. It's called Who Am I? And uh, that's, that's going to be about a defensive back that has played a previous defensive back. How, what's the word I'm looking for? A former defensive back. And uh, I'm going to give you some facts about that defensive back. And you guys are going to answer in the comments or you'll be able to email me uh, the answer to that. And I will pick someone uh, to get a free ebook version of 101 DV tips. So that's tough enough on the show today. Uh, I asked a question on my Twitter account that I found very interesting. The answers that came back having to do with uh, coaches and their relationship with players or that coaches pet peeves that's coming up. Also, uh, as always, the mail by the mailbag is open. Got a question out of the mailbag and um, we'll be looking forward to answering that. And then technique corner, we're talking about getting off blocks. And then of course the main topic that we've, uh, got coming up on the show, and that is it's not all about man coverage when you're playing in the secondary, folks. There's some other things for you to think about when you're back there. Um, and, you know, I'm going to have some thought-provoking um, answers for you here coming up on the show. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about the question that I asked on Twitter, just to be absolutely specific about the uh, the question that I did indeed ask. The question simply was, Coaches, what is your hard and fast thing? And um, I wanted to make sure I worded this this question correctly um, when I put it out there for coaches. But it was, what's that hard and fast rule that you have as a coach that if it's violated, you're putting a player on the bench? And it was, you know, obviously a pretty popular question. Coaches were eager to answer this on uh, Twitter. 
or S as we should say. And so uh, over a hundred comments on this question. And uh, there was a wide range of answers, but there was one prevailing answer that you got over and over. And it was simply this, a lack of effort. And I found that to be true. You, you know, obviously as a guy that coached for a while, um, obviously played the game. So got coached by coaches, saw coaches get pissed off about certain things. And um, and then again, I've experienced it as a coach. There's a lot of things that you can coach for a player. You can change a player's technique. You can he you can help a player with with his press technique. You can help a player get out of his breaks faster. You can help a player catch a ball. Whatever the case may be, all the physical things that have to do with playing this position, you can coach a player to do, or at least you think as a coach you uh, have the ability to change that in a player. One of the hardest things, though to change. And one of the hardest things to deal with is a player not giving effort. You're not going to give effort out there. As a coach, you feel really helpless with that player because nothing that you do is going to matter. And sometimes for a various wide range of reasons, by the time the kid gets to high school and then on into college, they formed some kind of idea about either their ability or their love for the game. And I've seen several things happen. Sometimes you've seen a guy float through youth football and he was an incredible player. And a lot of times what that ends up turning into is a player that was coddled and carried and not really uh, had a lot of things demanded from him while he was playing. And so you spend a good six, seven, maybe eight years of little league football with that type of mindset setting in through the very formative years. By the time they get to high school, when you as a coach, are starting and trying to demand some things out of them. They just don't understand that. They've always been able to kind of just do what they want. Maybe they weren't even asked to practice. They were allowed to mix practices or when they came to practice, they could give a minimal effort because let's face it, when you're in youth football, sometimes kids mature quicker and faster than others. And just on the fact that they are more mature physically than their counterparts, they're able to dominate with very little effort. And sometimes coaches just took advantage of that because it was more about them winning the games and being able to talk uh, trash to other coaches, whether that was online or in their face or whatever the case may be. And so they didn't demand much out of that player. They basically used that player to win games, but they didn't ensure that player's future. So that player gets to high school and now it's very difficult for them to give the necessary effort because the rest of the world, the rest of their peers have caught up to them and they don't have that physical advantage anymore. And now they are just very resistant to coaching. I've seen that happen. And I've also seen the other side too, where a player gets through all the youth football and listen, at that age, you're doing what it is your parents are asking or telling you or making you do. So they're telling you you're playing football. So you're out there, you're playing football every year. You don't really love it, but you're out there or you're just trying to please dad, mom, whatever the case may be. Now you get to high school and, you know, you have a little bit more freedom as to what it is you want to do. And player doesn't really love the sport like that. There's other things they would like to do. And I know for some people listening to this, listening to this or watching this is like, how could you not like football? Well, hey, listen, there are people out there that don't like football. And I'm here to tell you, some of them are actually playing it. So they, they happen to be good at it or they were forced to do it. They get to high school, college level, and now you're trying to coach them hard and get the most out of them because you see that there's some ability there and that player just doesn't want to give effort. So um, in those scenarios, you will get a situation where a player doesn't give effort or a player just doesn't like what's going on, don't like defense, whatever the case may be. At the end of the day, the biggest problem, the biggest pet peeve, the biggest thing that's going to get a player put on the bench by a coach is a player not giving effort, especially if you're beat deep on a play and you're just jogging after it. That's a good way to have a coach come pull you off put you on the bench. If he has any kind of options behind you, any kind of options behind you, that is a surefire way to get yourself put on the bench. Now, there were a number of other answers and they were stemming from um, lack of technique to uh, another crazy one that I heard. And uh, I need to talk to some coaches here on this. One guy said, if a player gets deep, that's a way, it gets beat deep, that's a way for me to put him on the bench. And to that, I say this. 
All right, I understand that getting beat deep on a play is catastrophic for the defense, for the team, et cetera. You feel like you've given up a cheap touchdown. On the other side, if you have your players out there as a coach in fear of getting beat deep, then I'm here to tell you you're going to make a robot and you're going to have a guy that's probably not going to be able to make very many plays. You're going to have a guy that's just overly concerned with getting deep on every play, and he will give up just about everything else in the route tree. He'll give up the curls, the comebacks, the outs, the slants, every other thing on the tree. Now, he might be good against routes eight and nine, but everything else under that, he's dead. And it, listen, I, I get it. You might say, i much rather have a, play, a team try to execute eight to nine to ten plays to get downfield rather than giving up a big play in one or two plays out there. I get it. But here's the other thing. If you turn your player into a scary player, he'll get beat on those deep balls too. Yes, he'll be back there because he's running out of there at the snap of the ball. But if you have created this fearful mindset and where he could get put on the bench, when that ball comes and he's back there deep with that wide receiver, rest assured, mentally, he's not going to be in the right place as that ball approaches. And a good receiver with hands, is going to go up and take that ball away from him nine times out of ten because a lot of this is mental. A lot of playing this position is more mental than physical than people care to really realize or even own up to. A lot of this thing is mental. What you need as a coach, what you need as a player, is to have a tremendous amount of confidence when you're playing. And if you are telling a player, you get beat deep, you're out of there. Even if they're back there, I'm here to tell you they will, as that ball is coming, have all kind of bad thoughts in their head. Hey, what if I don't catch this ball? What if he catches this ball? What if I don't get this ball knocked out of here? And he catches it. That means I'm going to the bench. I might never play again. All of this going through his head when he's in position. I would urge coaches out there to really not have that as a rule or not really hammer that into their player's head. One of your big jobs as a coach is to install confidence into your players. And that's going to come, A, from giving them the techniques so that they feel physically they know what to do. B, really getting them down and sound on the schematics, all right? So they've got a football IQ. They know where they're supposed to be in the defenses that you call. And they also understand what the offense is doing against them. So they have the, they have the intelligence. And then also it's just the confidence that you've instilled in them that when the ball comes their way, they can make a play. Or when their IQ kicks in and, they're, and they see something unfolding, that they have the liberty to go try and make that play. If you have told your player that if you get beat deep, you are getting out of the game, they may know that that comeback is coming. In a, in a, uh, granted, in a defense where they're allowed to go after that or that curl is coming, and they are allowed to go after it, but you just don't want to get beat deep, so they just allow it to happen. Hey, listen, again, I get it. You want teams to execute. That's fine during the regular season. I'm here to tell you, when you get into the playoffs, uh, one of the good things that teams do, especially teams that are good on offense, is execute. That's how they got to the playoffs. So, yep, they'll do seven and eight play drives. It will frustrate the hell out of uh, out of you they'll get all the way down the field with their seven eight nine ten plays score a touchdown and if you get the ball back now that all that time's run off the clock and your scary cornerback has just allowed everything to be caught in front of him because he's scared to death they go down there and they score and not only did they score a touchdown they ran a bunch of time off the clock and you get the ball back on your team with your team and your offense and you don't score and now you've given that ball back to that offense and they go down there and do it again, you're in a whole lot of trouble in that postseason. You're a whole you're in a whole lot of trouble in that district game, that conference game, that showdown that you have. Um at any level, you're in a whole lot of trouble. Because now you're behind, okay, and that team is gonna really now take advantage of the fact that they can hold the ball and just attack this one corner. All right, just run the route tree against the guy, just keep running curls and hitches and out routes and comebacks and all that. 
I listen, I understand. Maybe now you feel like, oh, I can just call a different defense. Well, maybe that might be true. But when you just call that different defense, now you're opening up something else. And there's some really good offensive coordinators out there that will see that. So if you're saying, oh, he's giving up short routes, let's just call cover two. Well, to call that cover two, you are lightening up the box. So now they just start running the ball. And they're getting four and five, six a pop, and they'll just execute right down the field. So the moral of the story here on this is you have to instill some confidence in your players. And one of the hardest ways to do that is telling them, if you get beat deep, I'm putting you on the bench. Your guy gets beat deep, bring him off the field, coach him up, ask him what he saw, what caused him to do what he did. That was one of the biggest things that I did as a coach is I'm trying to get some information from the player when they come off the field. So you want to make sure you have that relationship with your player. Hey, when I'm bringing you off the field and I ask you what you saw, this is not me cursing you out. This is not me getting on your case. This is me trying to get some information from you so that I can give you back some information that's going to help you, make you better, and put you in a better position when that situation comes up again. I'm going to send you back out on the field. Now, if this is happening over and over, obviously I need to do something. But this is part of the relationship you need to have with your player. And again, instilling confidence is at least 50% of what you're doing with your players. You want confident players out there running around, moving fast, and um, feeling like they're able to make a play. And telling them if they get beat deep, they're out of there is really, really the wrong way to do that. So uh, two things out of this first segment. Number one, if you're a player, you better be giving effort because it won't matter what you are in terms of speed, your height, your weight, who you think you are. If you're not giving effort, you are going to be pulled out at some point by your coach because they just can't coach that. They can't deal with it. They don't want to deal with it. They will find a replacement for you if you're a guy giving Lack of effort. Out of the 100 plus answers that were given to that question I asked on Twitter, that was the answer that popped up the most. Guy not, a uh, guy just not giving effort. The next was um, not being able to tackle, being either scared to tackle and just not using your technique to make, make tackles. All right. And, you know, you might think that as a surprise because you th- maybe some of you out there think the only thing you're supposed to be doing back there is a defensive back is covering wrong. You need to tackle, all right? In this day and age where they throw hit screens um, and they throw the ball short over and over and over, you have to be able to tackle because if you're not tackling those short plays, those short catches, those screens, those hitch routes, those slants can turn into 30-yard gains. And that's a really, really big problem. So a guy not being able to tackle. And then guys, you know, the next answers were guys not using their technique. That is a problem. That's something now that I would say would, you know, get a guy um, close to the bench for me. Like we go, I definitely teach DB's technique. I did that when I was a coach. We're definitely teaching technique. And if you're going to roll out there and not use any of the technique, you're wasting my time. You're wasting your time at practice because we definitely spend time on it. If you're not out there and you're, if you're out there and you're not going to use the technique that you're being taught, well, then you're going to get beat. We're wasting time. And so it's probably just time to move on or have you at least sit down for a while and figure out what it is you want to do as a football player back here. Basically, get with the program. All right, time for the mailbag, and I've got a good one this week, all right? You know, this oh, people always want to say things about defensive backs in their hands, and so um, this is a good one. Thomas from Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina says, thanks to your videos and book, I've been doing a great job getting myself in position to make plays. My biggest problem now is dropping interceptions. Dropped five in our seven-on-seven tournament this weekend. Are there any drills I can do to improve my hands? Okay, first of all, I know guys um, like to do this. The the moment they're having a problem with anything in defensive back, they want to know the drill to fix it. Well, there isn't always a drill, all right? right. As I've said in previous podcasts, there isn't a secret drill for all these things that are giving you a problem. I've got the bad news for you. The best way for you to improve your hands is to catch more footballs, all right? That's number one. The reason wide receivers have better hands than defensive backs typically is because wide receivers spend more time at practice catching the football. After all, it's a big prerequisite to the position. 
we as defensive backs have to spend some time on tackling, going over the scheme, being uh, uh, learning how to come out of a back pedal, how to play off, how to play zone, how to play man. There's a lot of things other than catching the football that we have to concern ourselves with. Yes, we do catch footballs in practice, but not nearly as many as wide receivers. Second of all, 9.5 times out of 10 when a DB or anyone is dropping the football, the problem is not with your hands, it is with your eyes. One thing I've noticed quite a bit in my years of coaching and training players is that after a while, players start to take the catching of the ball for granted. You throw enough balls to a football player um, or a defensive back where, you know, catching is not the primary thing like wide receiver. What starts to happen is they take it for granted. So the eyes start leaving the ball as it's coming in. They assume that as they've li- once they've lined their hands up, that the ball's going to go right into their hands and they're going to catch it. So their eyes move somewhere else. They start thinking about running after the catch or whatever the case may be, and they didn't exactly see that ball come into their hands, and that's where the drops start to happen. You get one or two of those in a row, now your mind starts playing tricks on you, and now you start lacking confidence that you're going to catch the ball, and now it starts piling up on you. Now you've dropped three, four in a row. You've dropped four out of five. And now it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The ball approaches. You start thinking about how you drop the last two or three, and you just start a roller coaster. When this happens to you in practice, I tell my guys this all the time when I'm training them, the number one thing for you to do is just go back to the basics. And that is see the ball coming in after you form that pocket. Watch the ball when it hits your hands. In your head, count to two, okay? Freeze your eyes on the ball, catch the ball, and say one, two after that ball has landed in your hands while you're looking at the tip of the ball. Freeze your eyes on the ball for two seconds. You run into a problem in practice, and for me, a practice is when you've dropped two balls in a row, you drop two out of three balls thrown to you, or half of, you drop two out of four. When you get to that, you drop two balls in practice, it's time to get back to freezing your eyes on the ball. I draw the baseball analogy as saying when a batter gets out of whack, even at the major league baseball level, and they start running into a slump, what do they do? They go back to the very first thing they did when they started playing baseball as a three or four year old. They go and they start put the ball on a tee and they hit the ball off the tee. So they just start all over. This is the same thing you need to do as a defensive back if you start dropping the football. Go back to putting the ball on the tee, which is freezing your eyes on the ball for two seconds. Once it hits your hands, 9.5 times out of 10, the reason you're dropping the football is because of your eyes. Unless you broke a finger or you broke a hand or something's going on with your hands in particular, it's not your hands. Nothing changed with your hands. It's your eyes. Your eyes are sending information to your hands. And when you take your eyes away from your hands, a lot of times you guys can feel it. The, The tip of the ball will hit the palm of your hand. Once it hits the palm of your hand, it bounces off of it, and now it's very difficult for you to catch the ball. You know, you're just not going to catch it when that happens. Or you didn't form a proper pocket because you took your eyes off and the ball busts through your hands or the ball hits some weird part of your hand that it's not supposed to hit, and now you didn't catch the ball. The reason that happened is because your eyes didn't see the ball go into the pocket of your hands and freeze on it. So it's usually not your hands. Now, for some especially if you're new and you've just always had a problem catching the ball and you know you have used your eyes to try and catch it, the ball still blows through your hands, and this will happen to some guys. Well, now you have weak hands and you need to strengthen your grip. So I would recommend to you that you get racket balls. Um, I wouldn't say tennis balls if you're a young player. It's, it's difficult to squeeze those. Those are harder to squeeze. But – um, use racquetball, something that you can get a little pressure on and, and, and squeeze a little bit and strengthen your hands with that. A little more uh, forearm work when you're in the weight room. So forearm curls, do that. Or have a nice little device. And, you know, if you're, I apologize to you if you're, you know, listening to this and not able to see it on YouTube. But this one of these handy doodahs right here. Use these. You can get these online anywhere. Uh, Amazon, eBay, whatever. Improves your grip. I've been using it lately because, as you guys know, I broke this wrist. So I've been trying to use this lately to strengthen my grip here. Some of y'all that can hear this 
on the podcast know what I'm talking about, but it's uh, um, for your strength. And perhaps um, as I, you know, put this podcast up, I can provide a link for you guys on Amazon, but anything to strengthen your grip. If you are for sure that your hands are the problem because you're seeing the ball in your hands and it's still blowing through your hands. Well, then now you have a grip problem and that's uh, going to change that for you. So Thomas in Raleigh, North Carolina, those are some tips for you. And the final tip that I will give you is if you do want to do drills, you can go about doing your normal um, footwork drills and catching the football. But instead of using the football, use a lacrosse ball. If you guys have watched me doing my drill work, you've seen me do a lot of drills where I'm throwing a lacrosse ball. Perhaps you thought it was a tennis ball, but it is a lacrosse ball. And the reason for that is when I've introduced a different item to catch, and it's much, much smaller than a football, it really brings the focus into mind for the athlete that they need to focus to catch this. You have to have a little bit more focus, not even a little bit, a lot more focus to catch a lacrosse ball with two hands than a bigger football. And so that brings the attention back now to catching the ball. Let's not take it for granted. And and it's kind of teaching us through repetition that we need to focus on this smaller item to catch it. So we're training the eyes to catch the ball there. So you can do that, Thomas. Go through some of your regular drills when you're in close proximity. I'm not recommending that you do deep ball drills and catch a lacrosse ball. That could be a recipe for disaster. You could take one off the face trying to track a ball, uh, a lacrosse ball from great distance, trying to catch it with your hand. So don't do that, Thomas. But something short, you're breaking on uh, comeback slants, curls, or you're doing just regular footwork and there's someone there with you that from you know no more than 10 yards away can toss you a lacrosse ball, you can do that. That will help you focus, use your eyes better to catch the football, and uh, that will help you there. All right, time for our segment on who am I? I'm going to give you guys a few facts on a defensive back, and um, you guys are going to answer in the comments section who you think it is. And I'm going to give us, uh, I'm going to give this about two, three days. So this, podcast is going to go up on the uh, 23rd of June, Sunday, June 23rd. By Wednesday, all right, and Wednesday is going to be the 26th, I am going to choose someone out of the comments and the emails that I receive. For those of you that are listening to this podcast and not watching it on YouTube, I am going to choose a winner out of the correct answers. You got to have the correct answer. So you're going to answer this in the comment section if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and, or you will send me an email to see Wilson and all eyes, tvcamp.com. If you think you know the answer, and I'm going to choose one person that has the correct answer as to who this DB is. And you guys are going to receive, uh, that individual is going to receive a free ebook copy of 101 DB tips. So here we go. Who am I? I attended North Carolina collegiately. I led the nation one year while I was at North Carolina in interceptions with 11. I was a second round pick to the NFL. Now, I'm not going to tell you what team I played on. That might be a little too easy, but I will tell you that I was a Super Bowl champion in my time in the NFL. I played for four NFL teams, including one team twice in my career. I made the Pro Bowl twice. And I had 43 career interceptions, including eight touchdowns. Who am I? Feel free to give your answer in the comments section or send me an email to cwilson at alleyesdbcat.com. And you, I choose you, by Wednesday, June 26th, will receive a free ebook copy of 101 DB Tips. My great reference guide for you guys out there that uh, want to take your game to the next level. And that's as a player, as a coach, or as a trainer. 101 DB Tips is a great book for that. Um, and um, the feedback on it has been absolutely great. Anything that you want to know about playing defensive back, how to play man, how to play zone, how to play safety, nickel back corner, how to train in the off season, how to watch film, uh, things on footwork, your drill work, all, all kinds of stuff. 101 DB tips. I cover it all in there through all my years of playing, coaching, and training. Um, so, yeah, 
you know, if you're fortunate enough to be picked, enjoy the book. Otherwise, guys, hit the link down in the description and pick up yourself a copy. If you don't want to wait to see if you are the winner, pick up a copy. It's available both as an ebook and as a soft cover. So definitely go ahead and grab that. Get your hands on that one. All right, Technique Corner. Let's talk about getting off of blocks. Why am I talking about this? Because it is a big part of what you do. Now, you know, some guys think I'm just here to cover. Okay, cool. Here's one thing that offenses will do, because I've spent some time as an offensive coordinator. Believe it a lot, folks. I coached wide receivers at one point and was an offensive coordinator. And here's a way that you can neutralize a lockdown corner if you happen to have that. You can run at that corner, all right? So we're trying to listen, your game is is locking guys up and 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 providing great coverage. I'm gonna make you do something else that I don't think maybe you're you're good at. So I'm gonna have you tackle that running back. I'm gonna get you in formations so that's gonna put you in that position to be the guy to have to be the one to tackle him. We'll block everyone else and we'll leave you out there with that running back. We'll throw screens at you, all right? Even if you are shadowing a guy, we'll put him um it, at the number two position in trips we'll put him inside in a slot and throw quick bubble screens to that guy now you've got to get off of a block and go tackle that guy we do that enough get you out of whack run through a couple of tackles shake your confidence a little bit get you mentally messed up and away we go now maybe we can just run some regular old routes against you now that we've got your mind messed up how you can combat that as a defensive back uh, both as a corner and a safety is just being solid as a tackler. Now I can't put that in my game plan. Not only can you cover, you can also tackle. That's you being a complete defensive back. But before you even get to that tackle, you got to be able to get off of blocks. And sometimes guys really, really struggle with that. Now I've got a great video on my YouTube channel about getting off of blocks, but I'm going to attempt to talk to you guys about this. And, um, you know, without visuals, try to explain to you guys some of the things that you can do. I'm going to start with the risky ones first and you know a couple of weeks back i posted a video of uh of a detroit lions defensive back in coverage and a bubble screen was thrown now he's an outside he was the outside corner and a bubble screen was thrown to the number two wide receiver the number one wide receiver was supposed to come off and block that corner um so that the bubble screen could get off and get some yards well, the number one wide receiver was taking his time coming off, and the cornerback saw an opportunity, so he ducked his shoulder, went inside, realized that the bubble screen was inside of him, all right? The guy hadn't gotten wide enough to be even with him or outside of him. He saw an opportunity because the number one wide receiver was taking his time, ducked inside, ran in there, and made the play. A bunch of people were had all kinds of comments about, oh, he should never go inside, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I get that's the general rule. I coached that same thing. It was coached to me, and that was the general rule. However, and this kind of stems back to what I was saying earlier about giving your guys the confidence to go make a play, because that number one wide receiver came off so soft, and this cornerback, Jerry Jacobs, by the way, if you guys are familiar with the defensive back that I'm talking about, and he is a fire plug. He's a, he's a guy that will go take some chances. Because he had that confidence and he saw the opportunity. So the guy catching, the number two wide receiver catching the mobile screen was inside of him. Rather than just run to the number one receiver's outside and get walled off and get into a shoving match and leave a big lane inside for that guy to catch the mobile screen and run up the field and, and, and perhaps run by the linebacker and the safety for a big gain anyway, he said, okay, let me duck inside, go make the play. Well, that's one of the ways, all right? that you can go make a play. A guy's just gonna set up and wait for you to go outside because he knows you're gonna go outside and you have out leveraged the play, whether it's a toss play to a running back or it is in this instance, a bubble screen or a quick screen to a number two or number three receiver inside of you. That means he's off to the inside shoulder. He's not yet gotten even with you or outside of you to what's the sidelines and you're not getting pressure from that wide receiver you can go like, uh, and when you decide to go, you've got to go, go in there full speed, go make the play. One other thing on that, once you get by that number one receiver, the best thing you could do is turn your back to him 
if you feel any pressure coming late, turn your back to him because now if he blocks you, that's going to be a clip. It's going to be a block in the back. So now you've rendered his block, his blocking attempt useless. Yes, I understand this is a risky play. It's a, it's a play that needs to be made based on that situation. So it's, some would call it a gamble. I would call this a calculated risk. When those factors come together, A, you've out leveraged the player getting the ball. B, you're not facing intense pressure from the number one wide receiver. This is when you go and do this. That's one way that you could go do this. Another controversial way that can pay big dividends is when, again, there is a play coming wide, whether it's a, a, a jet sweep, jet sweeps can be harder because there's, the guy's actually coming in motion. So a bubble screen or a toss or something of that nature, you can fool this wide receiver, especially if he's a guy that can tend to be kind of aggressive, is you from your outside cornerback position can pretend like you're going to dive down in there hard. So actually pretend like you're going to do what I told you to do on that last play and bring the wide receiver, the number one wide receiver, the widest wide receiver that's going to block you. Bring him inside really fast. He's going to panic when he sees that happen, okay? One of the worst things for wide receivers, and again, I coached him, is to be responsible for blocking on a toss play or a bubble screen and have your DB blow by you and then and blow up the, the ball carrier. It's one of the worst things that can happen to you as a wide receiver. You feel awful for your teammate and your coach is going to be going nuts on you. So you're going to instill some fear and some panic into that wide receiver when you dive down in there. Good three, four hard steps like you're going to cut inside of them. You're going to bring him over in front of you. He has to cut you off. When he cuts you off or he starts moving in there to cut you off, you plant, redirect back outside, and get yourself in a position to make a tackle on that toss play or on that bubble screen or that guy going out there. Now, I'm cautioning you against going too far because you could get out leveraged by the ball carrier. But a lot of times what will happen is you'll bring that wide receiver in. When you cut back outside, you have shortened the you've shortened the edge instead of just running outside and getting pushed outside by that wide receiver that's blocking you and opening up a huge lane for that running back with the toss to turn up into and giving him space to put a juke on a linebacker or a safety that's running the alley you can come down inside hard bring the wide receiver inside then cut back outside and now you're protecting the outside but at the same time, you have shrunken that alley for him to go into. Now the pursuit is coming. So a lot of times it will end up being you and that wide receiver or running back one-on-one -on -one to make a tackle because you've cut back outside on that wide receiver. Or if that wide receiver now gets hands on you, but you've gotten back outside, that running back or wide receiver with the ball has to turn up into a smaller alley. There's less room to juke, and now they've got to deal a little bit more with the linebacker coming over or a safety that's running down a more narrow alley now okay um perhaps you know there's a visual I, I can make a video of this for you but that's it all right those are two very um i would say i don't want to say risky techniques they are calculated risks but those are two tactics that you can use getting off of blocks as a corner to help yourself make some plays on tosses and sweeps that can really, really help you. Non-traditional ways. Now, the traditional ways are um, really being aggressive versus that wide receiver, extending and then using an arm over motion, okay? So you would grab that outside arm and lock that outside arm and then swim over him or lock that outside arm by grabbing the wrist or the elbow, as I've shown in the YouTube video. You guys can go find it there. I might put a link to that in the description down below, but grabbing the elbow, locking the elbow, and then ducking underneath. Once you get underneath, get your elbow into that receiver's side since you've locked his shoulder, pushing your elbow against his ribs or his back and clearing and getting beyond him. And now you can set up outside to uh, you know turn the play back inside or make the play if the receiver or ball carrier continues coming outside all right so there's the duck under all right the rip under or the arm over but it's all really set up by the fact that you grab that elbow 
or the wrist and lock the receiver's position to get by him. It's really when there is a run play and the receiver has to block you, you and the receiver change, um, you, you, you guys change responsibilities, okay? So basically, you're trying to get off of a jam from a wide receiver to get beyond him to go make a play, whereas on a pass play, a receiver is trying to get off of a jam from you to get beyond you to get wide open down the field. So the, your positions change, and the duck under with the, the, the rip under or the arm over, the swim, are two really good ways for you to defeat that block by the wide receiver, especially guys that are aggressive. If you get a guy that's not as aggressive and you don't want to go dive inside or shorten the edge, like I said in those first two examples, you can just go into them really, really hard, but and extend with your hands and push him back, and then you're going to shed him, all right? Butt him, extend out like you're bench pressing him, grab that near shoulder, pull it down, and just swim by the guy and get yourself in position and ready to make a tackle. This is something that's going to have to be practiced, but um, for you coaches out there, especially guys at the younger, smaller levels, these are some things that you want to teach. Again, I have a video on it um, that you can find on my YouTube channel. If I'm if if it's not linked in this description, um, just head over to my YouTube channel and, and just type in in uh, my channel search "getting off of blocks," and you guys will find the video that you need there, and it's a really good demonstration there for you. But as defensive backs, especially cornerbacks, the way passing attacks are set up nowadays, where they get those short passing attacks, uh, they will show they will throw quick screens, they will throw bubble screens, and things like that to neutralize you. If you don't get off of blocks and make tackles, you are gonna be a liability out there to your team. So it really won't even matter how much or how well you can cover the guy that's in front of you. You will be out there getting up yards and it can be very, very frustrating. It can kind of mess with your mind and um, kind of affect your ability to cover, right? Because now you're you know, getting preyed upon, you become bait out there and you're taking advantage a few uh in that situation guys um let's talk about the main topic right here and you know, what i want to talk to you guys about is playing db isn't all about man coverage i'm down here in south florida uh, i get to work with a lot of great dbs this is I, this is land of the defense and back sorry to you folks in california and texas yes you put out great defense and that you put out great talent in other places in the country Georgia as well coming off school but a lot of great defensive backs come out of Florida, and the number one thing they want to do down here is cover man-to-man. -man. It's just like it's a thing about your – it's like your manhood. It's can you cover man-to-man, -man? and I understand it. I get it. But here's the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is that uh, a lot of schools, the majority of what they play is zone. So if you're not good at zone – and you're really all about man, and you guys run man 30 to 40 percent of the game, then you're only good for your you're a 30 to 40 percent corner. If you're deep out there and you you don't play um, zone coverage very well, you know a lot of times the debate of who the best cornerbacks are, guys just get eliminated from the conversation simply because they play too much zone coverage. I've heard that before. I, I've heard the term. He's a zone corner. They say that immediately, and then, you know, whoever the cornerback is they're talking about gets slid to the back. It's like, you know, I got, again, playing zone is as important to playing defensive back as is playing man, and I'm, you know, going to tell you why. The idea of a defensive back, a cornerback in particular, in playing zone means you have help. OK, all right. So that's the problem when they hear those. Oh, a guy had help. He wasn't out there by himself. The idea that someone has help doing his job automatically lessens the ability of the player in the eyes of men. We have placed a premium in our society and doing things all by ourselves. Right. And we see that all on social media. I did this by myself. You know, I got it out the mud. You know, all these things that you hear. I got news for you guys. A cornerback playing man-to-man -man also has help, okay, especially if he's considered good at it. He knows where his help is. The best man-to-man -man defensive backs in the world would be nothing if they did not have help, even if it was cover zero and it was the pass rush. If you got a defensive back out there, that you, if Darrell Revis or Deion Sanders or whoever, Champ Bailey, whoever you guys think is the best, 
played on teams where there was absolutely no pass rush, guys, we would not be talking about them the way that they do. If you if you get they were out there and the receivers had five, six, seven seconds to run routes. I don't care who you are, Dion, Rebus, Bailey, Chant Bailey, and whoever else, you're not covering. You're going to be giving up yards. Covering a wide receiver for six seconds, play after play, is not the path to being a great all-time cover team or man. If anyone takes a look at, you know, like Deion Sanders' career, like I said, the Falcons were not a tremendous team when he came there in 1989. I mean, they did add talent immediately during his time there. I guess him being there and, you know, what they had going on in the front office with the team, et cetera, et cetera, brought people there. Um, and it certainly helped him with his man-to-man activities, let's say. Of course, he had a bunch of God-given talent, but they weren't sorry on defense. They had a pass rush. It definitely helped. There were definitely plays where pressure was put on a quarterback, and he had to get rid of the ball sooner than he wanted to in Dion's direction, or he didn't throw a good enough ball because he was under pressure in Dion's direction, and Dion made him pay for it, oftentimes taking it back for a touchdown. But one of the greatest things that happened is he left Atlanta in 1994 and went to the San Francisco 49ers, a team that obviously had more talent. They were perennial. Uh, if they weren't in the Super Bowl, they were in the NFC Championship game just about every year back then. And when he went to the 49ers, one of the elite franchises, he was surrounded by even more talent. And I'm talking about up front, great pass rushers, great linebackers, great safeties, everything. When they rushed the pass, they rushed the pass. Also, when they played man-to-man defense, the safeties and linebackers were more apt to be in the right place at the right time. Deion did not play cover zero all the time. We, the, you know, the the folklore out there, the, the legend of Deion might make it seem that way. And yes, he played a little bit more solo on the island than most guys. Yes, they would, you know, shoot the coverage away from him a lot more than others, but there were times where he had help from someone out there on the field, and if he didn't, it was a pass rush. And he had his best year, if you look at the stats, he had his best year of his career in 1994 when he went to the San Francisco. From there, he went to the Dallas Cowboys, another team that was better than the Atlanta Falcons, had a ton of talent, great guys around him, and... um, you know, the, the Cowboys at the time had won two championships. This was the Cowboys of the 90s. He was surrounded by a bunch of talent there as well, and a great amount of it was on the defensive side, and he continued to to uh, flourish as a Dallas Cowboy. Was he good as an Atlanta Falcon? Undoubtedly. Was he better as a 49er and a Cowboy? Yes, he was. Why? Because football is a team game, better personnel, better scheme, everything better at these two franchises. Of course, it is sexy to play man-to-man because it's put on display. Uh, It puts on display a lot of your physical talents, your speed, your ability to jump, your ability to, you know, all all of your physical abilities are on display. And we love that as fans. We love to watch that and see a guy jump high and run fast. That's just fun. We tend to call those guys the greatest. So, you know, people trying to say Aaron Rodgers is the greatest quarterback ever. He's more sexy in terms of physical abilities than a Tom Brady. If you're if you're in your right mind, you know Tom Brady's the best quarterback that has ever played. If you're just using your head, you know this. I'm Aaron Rodgers throws a great football, has great physical abilities, but in terms of production, it's Tom Brady. However, playing in a zone highlights the mental capabilities of you as a defensive back. All right, I've got news for you. The game is won from the neck up. I've said that a bunch of times. So for defensive backs that are playing high school football, let's say, I get that you want to be known as a shutdown corner, and it's certainly important for you to work on your man-to-man skills. However, nothing is more frustrating for a defensive coordinator that has a defensive back that's too limited mentally or lacks the discipline to play a zone. Every now and then, a team will scheme against your man. There comes a time when you have to play zone defense. It may be when you have a big lead and you want to protect it. It may be when another player is injured and you have to now put a replacement in and that guy doesn't cover as well as man-to-man, so now you've got to play zone. It may come when the other team has a matchup that they might want to exploit, so they have a guy that you really can't cover man-to-man and you, you want to play some zone. Um, The offense could come up with a great scheme, stacks, bunches, and all those good things to take you away from 
from playing man, and now you need to play zone. Whatever the case may be, having a cornerback that can switch from playing man to man to playing zone is really what makes the defense effective. It makes you a great player. You cannot be a one trick. So my message to defensive backs out there is it's great. I know you want to work on your press man coverage. Do that. You should definitely try to be elite at that because when you are a press man corner and you can eliminate a guy in press, it does give you a tremendous amount of value. I'm also here to tell you that if you think that's all there is to playing defense back, you're dead wrong. Don't go to college and get hit over the head with the playbook, all right? Tell my guys that I train this all the time. I've seen many a talented defensive back in high school who could cover man-to-man, fail at the next level because they go to college, they hand them the, the stick playbook. It's not all man-to-man. It's cover four, cover six, cover eight, cover two, cover three, stubby, Cleo. There's a bunch of coverages that are going to put in there. Not all man-to-man. you got to know how to play zone because – you know, it's just not as simple as it was in high school, okay? Be a great man, corner, that's where your passion is. You better know how to play So Football, again, is the ultimate team game. And if you're thinking that you can just set up shop on a team's defense and play your own individual thing, play your own little man coverages and do your own thing out there, you are going to be sorely mistaken. There's only one Dion out there. There's only one Rebus. I know you want to be the next one, and perhaps you will be, but I'll, t- I'll tell you what, all of those guys I named could play man. They could play zone as well as they played man coverage. The reason you don't really know that is because the, you know, the zone stuff they did wasn't as sexy. And so we don't talk about it as much. It wasn't highlighted as much. And that's just the way that things went. Okay. We don't really talk a whole bunch about zone. But if you're going to be a great player, you've got to be able to play zone. As well as man, you got to be good off the ball as you are in press. I think I've gotten that point home here to you today. I hope you guys take my advice on that. So study, work on your off man footwork, understand how to play off man, understand how to play zone. Okay, know where you're supposed to be in your zone coverages. You might like it. You might like the fact that you're able to see the quarterback and talk to an area and and get an interception. So good way to nap two, three, four extra interceptions each and every year, all right? So work on that zone coverage, guys out there. Don't be a one-trick pony that has to press all the time or you are no good. I've seen dudes absolutely fall apart at rivals and Nike camps when the coach says, I don't want you guys pressing. You got to play off. Dudes just completely fall apart. Don't be that guy. Be a well-rounded corner. In fact, when I used to work those camps, that was one of the number one things that I looked at. Let me see a guy play off. Let me see his footwork. That tells me something about his IQ, And then his footwork told me a little something about his ability to adapt and his athleticism, things like that. Guys that got up and pressed all the time and just beat a guy up on a line of scrimmage, especially a wide receiver that was just really not worthy. I wasn't overly impressed with those type of guys. All right, hope I got that message across to you. And that's my time. I'm going to head up out of here. Hope you guys enjoyed the Indie Drills podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, whether you're listening to me on the podcast or watching on YouTube so you don't miss the next Indie Drills podcast that comes out. On top of that, uh, make sure you pick up a copy of 101 DB Tips, all right, whether the ebook or the soft cover version. If you're a defensive back out there or you're a coach uh, coaching defensive backs, you got to have a copy of this book, all right? There's no really if, ands or buts about it. If I had something like this when I was coming up, there's no telling what I would have done. I had to go to a library to try and find a book on defensive back play. And I'm here to tell you, I didn't find one. All right. I don't know of any others like this out there. So go ahead and make that investment in yourself. Also, I've got the All Eyes DB Camp members area, over 200 videos showing technique, coverages explained, um, uh, analysis of techniques broken down and drills and everything like that. I have a link to that in the description as well. A combination of these two things, and there's no way you can't be a top of the line DB. So you got to invest in yourself. So go ahead, check those out. And um, until next time, guys, well, first of all, share the video and like this video. Let's get this podcast to be really, really big time. All right, guys playing out in the secondary need help. It's all about offense these days. They want to pile up passing stats and fantasy stats. Oh, no, no, no. Let's get let's get this stuff shut down. So pass this stuff around. Get people in here to watch the Indie Drills podcast. And make sure you give an answer to uh, who am I. That who am I question is going to be giving out a free copy of All Eyes DB Camp ebook version. All right, that's it for me. I'm out. Until next time, All Eyes DB Camp. Consistency breeds results.